Hi everyone, this is Professor Aaron Das Science and today I want to discuss spherical harmonics in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. Spherical harmonics are the eigenfunctions of orbital angular momentum in quantum mechanics. As such, they feature in many problems, but most importantly, they feature in the hydrogen atom. Today we're going to dissect the mathematical form of the first few spherical harmonics. And we're also going to visualize them. And I hope you will agree that they look rather cool. We also have a link in the description to a Jupyter notebook, which has some Python code to generate the spherical harmonics. So I encourage you to take a look and see what it does. So let's go. The main reason why we study spherical harmonics is that they play a central role in the theory of orbital angular momentum in quantum mechanics. This is the eigenvalue equation for the squared angular momentum. And this is the eigenvalue equation for the z component of orbital angular momentum. The L squared eigenvalues are labeled by the quantum number L, and it can only take non-negative integer values. And the LZ eigenvalues are labeled by the quantum number M, and for a given L, m can only take one of the values minus l, minus l plus one, and so on, all the way to l. However, today's focus is not on the eigenvalues, but instead on the eigenstates that are shared by both l squared and lz here and here. These eigenstates are the so-called spherical harmonics. In the video on orbital angular momentum eigenfunctions, we determine an explicit expression for these eigenfunctions. We can write the spherical harmonic YLM of theta phi as equal to this long prefactor multiplied by a phase factor, and then this other long expression involving sines and cosines. As you may suspect, we can rewrite spherical harmonics in a number of alternative but equivalent ways. A very common form is that in which we dump all the terms involving sines and cosines into a function. And then we can write the spherical harmonic YLM as equal to this long prefactor multiplied by the phase factor and everything multiplied by a function PLM of the cosine. These functions P here are called the associated Legendre polynomials. They're actually a rather interesting family of mathematical functions, but today we are not going to explore them any further. So if you're interested in learning more about them, I encourage you to check them out elsewhere. Today, we will explore the first few spherical harmonics, and to do so, we're going to use this expression up here. We're going to both write down their mathematical form explicitly, and we're also going to visualize them. The visualization of spherical harmonics is something that you will often encounter because spherical harmonics feature in a variety of quantum systems, most importantly the hydrogen atom. To understand how we will visualize them, we first need to note that the spherical harmonics depend on the two angular variables theta and phi. So let's draw a set of coordinate axes. Let's consider a general point here at a position given by the vector r from the origin. And in spherical coordinates, we describe the position of this point with a set of three numbers. The first is the distance between the origin and the point, which is the magnitude of the vector r, and we call it the scalar r. The second is the angle between the vector r and the third axis, and we call it theta. And the third is built by first projecting the vector r onto the horizontal plane, and then measuring its angle with respect to the first axis, and we call it phi. As r is the length of a vector, it can only be zero or positive. The angle theta runs from zero to pi, and the angle phi from zero to two pi. The spherical harmonics only depend on the spherical coordinates, and what we will do to represent them is to plot them on the unit sphere. Now this here is an example of how we will plot the spherical harmonics. This happens to be the real part of the spherical harmonic y1-1, but for now all that matters is how we are representing it. We're not going to plot the coordinate axes in general, but for now uh, they're these three here and they should help you as a reference. At every angular position on the unit sphere, the color shows the value of the function. 
such that the red regions show the angular positions where the function takes large positive values. In this case, this region here, which corresponds to theta equals pi over two and phi equals zero, has large and positive values. And the blue regions show the angular positions where the function takes large negative values. And in this case, this is hidden at the other side of the sphere with the most negative value centered around theta equals pi over two and phi equals pi. For intermediate values, we plot the function with a color scale that goes from positive red to negative blue through zero, which is white. In this particular example, both the north pole here corresponding to theta equals zero and the south pole hidden behind here corresponding to theta equals pi are both white, which means that the function is zero at those positions. And in fact, the function is zero along a whole great circle that unites the two poles for values of phi equals pi over two here and phi equals three pi over two on the other side. As I said, for clarity, we're not going to show the axes. And to understand these plots better, we will often rotate the coordinate axes like this, allowing us to see the value of the spherical harmonic in all angular directions. Right, so with this, let's get started with our exploration of the spherical harmonics. The spherical harmonics are labelled by the quantum numbers L and N. As L is associated with the magnitude of orbital angular momentum, we will use this as the main quantum number from which to build the spherical harmonics. So let's start with L equals zero. This implies that M is also zero. The corresponding spherical harmonic is therefore y0,0. Zero, zero. And so if we start with the prefactor here, we can write it down inserting L equals zero and M equals zero. Most terms are now trivial and the prefactor reduces to one over square root of four pi. Let's next look at the phase factor and using M equals zero, it becomes this, which is trivially equal to one. Finally, we can look at this final term and writing it out with L equals zero and M equals zero, we see that it also trivially becomes one. So overall, the spherical harmonic Y zero zero is equal to the constant one over square root of four pi. This here is a plot of the Y zero zero spherical harmonic. It is trivially a solid uniformly red sphere. The color is uniform because the function is a constant, which means that it has the same value in all directions. And it is red because we are using red to depict positive values. Also, note that the function is purely real. So this single diagram is all that we need to depict the Y00 spherical harmonic. Let's now consider L equals one. For this value of L, there are three possible values of M minus one, zero, and one. So let's start with L equals one and M equals minus one so that we have the spherical harmonic Y one minus one. If we start with the prefactor here, we can write it down inserting L equals one and M equals minus one. This part here is equal to minus one over two and the argument of the square root here simplifies to three eighths of pi. Together, the prefactor turns into this expression. Let's next look at the phase factor. Using m equals minus one, it becomes this. And finally, we can look at this final term and writing it out with L equals one and m equals minus one, we get this expression. At this stage, it is convenient to rewrite this sine squared in terms of a cosine squared using the standard trigonometric relation. Putting everything together, we get this new expression. Now looking at the second derivative term here, we get minus two, so that the full term becomes minus two sine theta. Overall, the spherical harmonic y one minus one is given by this prefactor, this phase factor, and all multiplied by sine theta. And we can also separate this expression into its real part and its imaginary part. These plots show the y1 minus one spherical harmonic. The top diagram shows the real part, while the bottom diagram shows the imaginary part. So let's start with the real part, which is given by this term up here. 
Remember that the angle along the horizontal plane is measured by phi, and that phi runs from 0 to 2 pi. Looking at the real part of the spherical harmonic up here, we see that the phi dependence is fully captured by this cosine term. Let's therefore see how this cosine phi term changes as we travel along phi, and to do so we will consider a fixed theta, and specifically we will look at the horizontal plane. At phi equals to 0, the cosine is equal to 1. This gives a positive maximum value, which is represented by the red colour here. When phi grows to pi over 2, the cosine becomes 0. This corresponds to this point here on the horizontal plane where the colour plot turns white. When phi grows to pi, the cosine becomes minus 1 and this gives a negative value, which is represented by the blue colour hidden at the back of the diagram. Moving to phi equals 3 pi over 2, the cosine becomes 0 again, and the function vanishes again represented by the white colour at this edge. And completing the loop to phi equals to 2 pi, we get that cosine is again 1, and we are back to the maximum red value here. So this is it for the phi dependence. The real part of the y 1 minus 1 spherical harmonic exhibits a full cosine oscillation from positive to negative and back to positive, and pictorially we get red, white, blue, white, and back to red. So let's make some room. Remember that the angle from the vertical plane is measured by theta, and that theta runs from 0 to pi. Looking at the real part of the spherical harmonic up here, we see that the theta dependence is fully captured by this sine term. So let's therefore see how this sine theta term changes as we travel along theta. For simplicity, let's start at the fixed phi equals zero, and then theta varies along this great circle from the north to the south poles. At the north pole, for theta equals zero, sine theta is also zero. This means that at the north pole here, we have the colour white. As theta grows to pi over 2, sine theta becomes 1, and we get the maximum positive value in red here. And then as we continue all the way to the south pole at theta equals pi, sine theta becomes 0 again. And we get a white south pole down here, although it is hidden behind the sphere from this view. We of course have the same theta dependence at different values of phi, but for example if we now travel along this great circle corresponding to phi equal pi over 2, we get a white line throughout because although there is a sine dependence along theta, it is multiplied by this cosine phi up here, which is equal to 0 along this great circle. Let's make some room again. If we next look at the imaginary part, it is given by this second term up here. We see that the theta angle has the same sine dependence as the real part, while the phi angle is now given by a sine rather than a cosine. This means that the real and imaginary parts are offset by 90 degrees as is clear from the figures. We can finally make these diagrams rotate to appreciate the full angular dependence. It's not the easiest to get your head around this type of plot, so I recommend that you take your time until it becomes completely, completely clear. Ok, let's now look at L equals 1 and M equals 0. We have the spherical harmonic Y10, and I won't go over the derivation in detail this time as it is analogous to what we've just done for the y1-1 case, but I really do encourage you to try it out as it is really good practice. We get the prefactor square root of 3 over 4 pi times the cosine of theta, and overall y10 is purely real. This here is a plot of the y10 spherical harmonic, and as it is purely real, we only need one diagram. We see that y10 does not depend on the angular variable phi, which implies that the spherical harmonic looks the same in all directions within the horizontal plane, as we can clearly see in the diagram. y10 does depend on theta through this cosine function. At the north pole, where theta is 0, the cosine takes the maximum value, hence the red colour. Then on the horizontal plane, corresponding to theta equals pi over 2, 
the cosine vanishes, and this is indicated by the white band. Finally, at the south pole, where theta is pi, the cosine takes its maximum negative value, and we get the blue color. Again, as there is no phi dependence, these results are true along any phi direction. And again, do spend as long as you need to really make sure that this plot makes sense. Finally, let's look at L equals 1 and M equals 1. We have the spherical harmonic Y11. Again, leaving the duration for you, we get this prefactor, this face factor, and all multiplied by sine theta. We can separate this expression into a real part, plus an imaginary part. This here is a plot of the Y11 spherical harmonic. The top diagram again shows the real part, while the bottom diagram shows the imaginary part. The expression is really quite similar to the one that we have for the spherical harmonic Y1-1. The imaginary parts are in fact the same, and the only difference between the real parts is this minus sign here. This means that the only difference in the plots is that the real part is the negative of the real part of the Y1-1 spherical harmonic, and if you remember, in that one we had red in front and blue at the back, whereas here we have blue in the front and red at the back. The real and imaginary parts are again offset by 90 degrees from each other, and we can again make them rotate to better appreciate the full angular dependence. As a summary, we have here the three spherical harmonics for L equals 1, with the top diagram showing the real parts, and the bottom diagrams showing their imaginary parts. It's not really trivial to get your head around these plots, so again, do take as long as you need to make sure that you are absolutely happy with the plotting. So let's next consider L equals 2. For this value of L, there are five possible values of n. Minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. The derivation of the mathematical form of the spherical harmonics is analogous to that of the previous two examples, so we will write the relevant expressions directly. We can write y2-2 and y22 together, and they are equal to these prefactors, these face factors, and sine square theta. We next have y2-1 and y21. These are the prefactors, these are the face factors, and then we have sine theta, cosine theta. And finally, we have y to 0, which is purely real and is given by this expression. These here are the five spherical harmonics for L equals 2, with the top diagram showing their real parts and the bottom diagram showing their imaginary parts. I'm not going to discuss them in detail, but I recommend that you spend some time trying to relate their mathematical form with the corresponding figures. You may agree that they are actually quite beautiful, but to fully appreciate their angular dependence, we can also make them rotate about the vertical axis, starting with y2 minus 2, then y2 minus 1. y2 0 doesn't have a phi dependence, so it looks the same at any angle about the vertical axis. And we can also make y2 1 rotate, and finally y2 2. We could of course go on and plot additional spherical harmonics, and here I have the L equals 3 spherical harmonics. We can again make them rotate for better visualization, starting with y3-3, then y3-2, y3-1, again the y3-0 spherical harmonic is purely real and doesn't depend on phi, so it's the same in all directions. Moving to y3-1, we can again make it rotate. The same for y32, and finally for y33. We've generated all of these figures using Python, and you can have a go yourself plotting spherical harmonics by following the link to the Jupyter Notebook in the description. And overall, I hope you will agree that these diagrams have a rather captivating beauty about them. To finish, I just want to point out that you will encounter spherical harmonics depicted in a variety of ways. 
I personally think that the approach that we've taken today is particularly clear because it really highlights the angular dependence of the spherical harmonics by plotting them on the unit sphere. The top row here shows again the real part of the L equals 1 spherical harmonics that we've discussed earlier in the video. And just as a reminder, we've been plotting the functions at every angle on the unit sphere and capturing their value with a color figure. Red for positive and blue for negative, smoothly connected through white, which corresponds to zero. However, there is another very common approach to plotting these functions, and you're bound to encounter it elsewhere, so I wanted to very briefly describe it. We show this alternative approach in the bottom row. In this case, we use the magnitude of the function along each direction to define a radial distance, and then plot the function at that radial distance rather than plotting it on the unit sphere. So we can again make all of these rotate for ease of visualization, starting with y1 minus 1. The y10 have no phi dependence, so they look the same along any phi angle. And we can also make the y11 rotate. And as always, I recommend that you spend some time convincing yourself of this alternative depiction, as it is also used very commonly. Here I am now comparing the real parts of the spherical harmonics for L equals 2 with our original plots in the top column and the alternative plots in the bottom column. We can again make them rotate, starting with the y2 minus 2, then y2 minus 1. As usual, y20 is phi independent, but we can also make the y21 rotate, and we can also do the same for y22. So again, do spend some time familiarizing yourself with these. And finally, we have the comparison to the real part of the spherical harmonics with L equals 3. And we make them rotate because it's cool. And we have the y3 minus 3, the y3 minus 2, the y3 minus 1, the y30, which you guessed right, is phi independent. And we can also rotate the y31, the y32, and the y33. Final comment. Although we've been plotting the real and imaginary parts of the spherical harmonics, you will often encounter plots that show their absolute value squared. We're not going to explicitly go into those, but you should be able to construct and interpret these alternative plots with similar strategies to the ones that we've used today. I hope that you've enjoyed visualizing the spherical harmonics and remember that they are extremely useful in a range of problems, especially the hydrogen atom. And again, remember that you can generate these spherical harmonics yourself by using the Python code that we've linked in the description. And as always, if you liked the video, please subscribe.